I think we have everyone in from the waiting room, Danny. Okay, great. Welcome everyone to Wisconsin's Rare Disease Day event 2021. Thank you all for being here. Um, we are gonna jump right into it because we have so much, um, so many people to hear from today and just so much information. So it's wonderful, but we wanna get started. So um, we'll continue to let people in as we move along here. First, we're going to um, kick off with a two videos. They're going to be played back to back. And just to ease the burden on bandwidth here and hoping that the um, videos will play as they should, if everyone doesn't mind just turning your webcam off just while we watch the videos, um, that would be great. So if everyone can just switch their webcams off while we watch these two videos, they'll be back to back. Um, and then once we're finished with those, then you can pop back on so we can see everyone's faces. That would be great. I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunaishi, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Minisu Rutani. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Ana penda kunitazama ni kipuliza mapovu. Yai, as querida, os pelos pelos minha família, né? Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari-harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O var me apologue. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. Atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumuona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavifurahi tunapuenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik hubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Their fierce support. Sua bondade inabalável. Minibandeira. Enfermeiras. Doctors. Support workers. Assistente. Mashirika ya wagonjwa. Together, we are a strong community. Minibandeira com ele aqui. Histórias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Oh, como você está lendo? I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has CASC, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafi dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha leonio-sarcoma, um câncer raro. Oh, Yoni Harvey, ana SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. Yoni Christian, oi, ai, har, ui, me fa pel, chorat. Esta é minha vida, suara saia. And I am more than my disease. We are with. Camira mãe, nós somos fortes. And we are proud. Welcome. I'm Peter Saltonstall. I'm Peter Saltonstall, President and CEO of the National Organization for Rare Disorders. I would like to welcome you to our 2021 Virtual Rare Disease Day event. Before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the Rare Disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country. And some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those in the state legislature, where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them, and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. We know that building a diverse coalition of rare disease community stakeholders is really critical in being able to implement RDACs and make them work effectively. As a matter of fact, so NORD's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils.
happen. So today, we look forward to hearing from. We apologize for Sorry the technical that. difficulty. We'll get that cleared up and hopefully we can play the other video at the end. I apologize for that. Thank you, Elise. Bound to run into some uh, surprises here during virtual time. So thank you. Um, all right, so welcome again, everyone, to our 2021 Rare Disease Day event. Um, for those of you who I have not yet been able to meet, um, my name is Danny Sun. I serve as NORD's uh, Rare Action Network Volunteer Ambassador here in Wisconsin and have done so for the last couple of years. Um, it's my privilege in this role to organize the Rare Disease Day event each year with the support of NORD and many other incredible advocates um, who make this day what it is. So thank you for taking your time out for what is sure to be your 18,000th Zoom meeting in the last um, 12 months. We really appreciate it. Before we get started, we do just want to share our medical and legal disclosure. Um, I won't go over all of the details, but basically we can't provide um, medical advice. We are not doctors, so please rely on your treatment teams for any questions you have specific to um, a rare disease that you are facing. So, um, do you want to go to the next slide? Perfect. Um, real quick, I wanted to just share my connection with um, to the rare community, and that is my two children, Ruby and Landon. They were both diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, in 2013. Um, they're both doing very well. They're on treatments that have been approved recently in the last few years, thanks to a lot of advocacy and, and hard work. Um, and we also worked um, pretty closely in the state of Wisconsin here for um, to get SMA added to the newborn screening panel, which is uh, newborn screening is so important and so many advocates work for that. So that's something that we're real passionate about. So they are my reason for advocating and for um, striving to make a positive impact on our rare community here in Wisconsin. So thank you all for um, attending today and, and being part of that positive impact. So to start off, I will um, turn it back over to Elise Patel, the Manager of State Policy for the Western region or Western half of the US, which we fall into um, the way it's divided up here in Wisconsin, um, and to share a little bit more about um, NORD policy efforts. Thank you so much, Danny. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. As Danny mentioned, I'm Elise Patel, and I serve as the Western Region um, State Policy Manager for NORD. So glad to be with you today. And we're excited to share a little bit more about NORD's Rare Disease Advisory Council work and why ARDAC started and where we're headed this year. So as many of you know, 25 to 30 million Americans are impacted by a rare disease, which breaks down to about one in 10 individuals. And while that's quite a few people that are directly impacted by a rare disease, we're finding that lawmakers aren't necessarily aware of these unique challenges that are faced by the rare disease community. So our solution was to form rare disease advisory councils where a diverse group of those in the rare disease community could come together and really advise state government. And this is especially important because we know that a lot of our healthcare decisions are actually made at the state level. Um, so we see this as an enormous opportunity to partner with our legislators and the community in a strategic way that can really address issues on an ongoing regular basis. Our first council was created in 2015 by fantastic advocates in North Carolina and since then has gained quite a bit of traction across the country. So as you'll see from this slide, we currently have 16 states that have passed ARDAC legislation with Massachusetts being the last state to do so just last month. And much of this progress has happened over the course of the last two years with 10 governors signing ARDAC legislation into law since 2019. And NORD launched what we call Project ARDAC this past year as a way to help optimize the existing ARDACs and then also increase the number of ARDACs across the country. 
And under this initiative, NORD is planning to provide opportunities for the RDACs to collaborate with each other, as well as providing educational resources to guide these RDACs every step of their journey. And we welcome you to visit our website, rarediseases.org, and click on the Project RDAC tab, where you'll find some more information, resources, our upcoming events. It's where we put all of our coalition meetings that are scheduled, as well as an interactive map where you can view state-specific information. So currently in Wisconsin, we don't have an RDAC in place. However, we're hoping that with all of your help, we can establish a council. Um, and this will include building out, we already have a coalition that we started, but we really would like to continue to um, grow that coalition and make sure that we have a diverse representation of stakeholders from the entire rare disease community to make sure that each and everyone's individual voice is heard in this effort. So if you are interested in getting more involved, please feel free to visit um, or to email us. Our email address is rdac at rarediseases.org. And then again, welcome you to check out that Project RDAC website for more information of what that looks like. And I also wanted to briefly go over our Nord State Report Card with everyone. This is our sixth year publishing a state report card. And the report card is a tool to evaluate how effectively states are serving the rare disease community, um, a way to track individual state progress on priority policy issues and enable effective advocacy by providing that tangible tool to see how your state measures up in key areas. And the issues outlined touch on several critical and relevant policy areas. However, we do understand that there are still other policy areas that impact the lives of rare disease patients. And this year, we transitioned the report to a new interactive um, digital format. So the, there's a state report card landing page, as well as a web page for each of the eight issues that are highlighted in the report. And feel free um, to use the link listed here and then also in the chat box to see how Wisconsin measures up and any other states that you might be interested in taking a look at. And I also wanted to um, explain a little bit more about the methodology behind the report card. So all of the data that you'll see on the report is data as of November of 2020, with the exception of the Rare Disease Advisory Councils. You'll see those don't actually have a grade, but we did update our RDACs through December to reflect the exciting passage of RDACs in both Ohio and Massachusetts that happened at the end of the year. And then any current bills that are in the state legislatures or bills that may have already even passed um, at the beginning of 2021 were not factored into the report card or the grading scale. And each issue, if you dive into the report card, you'll notice has its own appendix that we derive the overall grade from. And then each individual state page contains a grading methodology section where you can figure out and find more information of how the issue was evaluated. And with that, I welcome you to reach out to us again. This is our policy email, so policy at rarediseases.org. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding Project RDAC or even our state report card. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to you, Danny, to introduce our next speaker. And thank you. Thanks, Elise. All right, so we are going to pick up our first um, speaker here. I'm excited to introduce um, Stephanie Club and her family are here um, to share. Well, Stephanie and also Genevieve Fache, I hope I'm saying your last name right, Genevieve, um, are both here today to share a bit of their stories, um, although different, both with um, in regards to Pompeii disease. So thank you for being here. And Stephanie, you can start whenever you are ready. Okay, are we good? Yep, we can see you and hear you. Perfect. <laughs> All right, we're going to start off here. Thanks, Office, for having us. We appreciate it. I think we went down and saw you down last year, and that was a pretty neat event to be able to see you in person, but I guess this is what we get to do with now. Um, <laughs> sorry we write down stuff, so I'm not good at speaking. Uh, so 
My name is Mike, and this is our <laughs> my name is Mike, and this is our smallest Pompeii warrior, Gwendolyn. Uh, we have six other children in here at home with us. Uh, they start raising a large family, presents some unique challenges, and is it's a very understatement to say that adding a rare disease into the mix has definitely been an eye-opening experience of patience and perseverance. I don't want to take too much time sharing the beginning of our rare journey, but at the same time, I think it is important to highlight a few aspects. Our rare disease journey began in 2017 when our youngest daughter was diagnosed with Pompeii disease from a newborn screening test. Wisconsin had been conducting a pilot study for the Pompeii disease off the newborn screening panel, and Gwendolyn was the first baby from that study to test positive for late onset Pompeii disease. Fast forward with five cheek swabs and lots of waiting, and we learned that our eight year old and our 13 year old sons were also positive for the late onset Pompeii disease. Our youngest son was born with an umbrella and of the pilot study, so he was tested through his newborn screening test. No waiting for weeks on the results of cheek swabs for him. So while we have a fantastic healthcare team for our children, learning that the pilot study ended with automatically being placed on the newborn screening panel really left Steph and myself thinking about undiagnosed Pompeii babies in Wisconsin. Understanding that we had the opportunity to be as proactive as possible for our children's health left us feeling extremely guilty. We knew that families would be going through heartbreaking experiences as they learned that their baby's diagnosis, a diagnosis that hopefully came in time to begin enzyme replacement therapy. So while we knew we wanted to get Pompeii disease on the uh, Wisconsin's newborn screening panel, we had absolutely zero idea how to go about it. We were socially media dinosaurs. We're ancient. We don't play that game very well. Um, and had no idea where to begin advocating for newborn screening. We found the Everyday Life Foundation and quickly signed up for their rare and rare, rare on the road event in Sioux Falls. While waiting to attend the day-long event, we did a few Google searches on newborn screening in Wisconsin which led us to contact the state lab about what we needed to nominate a disease. We printed out the six page form, looked at the information we needed nine for the, we needed the information we needed for the nine criteria. And we just wanted to cry. We had no clue what to do. Steph and I consider ourselves relatively intelligent people, but we couldn't get past the information needed under the condition screening method, which wasn't even the first criteria. Frustrated, we reached out to our local pediatrician to see if he would help out. We reached out to our genetic counselor, and we reached out to our Madison and Duke teams. If you see this theme here, you'd be correct. We're on the phone or emailing daily to ask for help completing the nominating, nomination form. We aren't physicians, nurses, scientists, or researchers. We didn't have access to medical journals or most recent studies. Our healthcare teams weren't sure what they could help us with without having a conflict of interest. We were stuck and we hadn't even really began advocating yet. After gaining some interest from Genevieve and other Wisconsin Pompeii moms, we hey. moved forward and learned how to speak with our state representatives through the Every Life Foundation. We set up meetings and phone calls with Senator Tessman, Representative Van Demeer, and Representative Ron Kine because we wanted to make sure we had support just in case our nomination fell through, a backup plan, you know, so to speak. <clears throat> We finally had a breakthrough with our nomination from when our genetic physician undertook the responsibility of getting the research together for the criteria. We were grateful that there was some forward momentum in the nomination. When Pompeii disease was approved by all three nomination committees by March 2020, we were ecstatic. We received a letter from the Secretary of Health in May 2020 and assumed that the implementation of Pompeii disease would be very quick. Unfortunately, last month we learned that it would be an additional 18 to 24 months as a rulemaking process was conducted. We have had a hard time finding information on when the next meeting will be virtually or in order to share with our Pompeii families. Along with our own family and friends, we're invested in seeing this through the end. Having public statements made that would benefit the addition of Pompeii disease while also having notice to when the next rulemaking process meeting will be held would be useful. Spending the time searching for this information feels like an unnecessary extra hurdle for rare families. Our experience with advocating for newborn screening may have been a tad rocky, but we believe that it was and will be a journey that Wisconsin families will benefit from. We're hopeful that the RDAC becomes a reality in Wisconsin as families find their footing in their own rare disease journey. The RDAC will undoubtedly benefit families through awareness and understanding around the challenges that families face on issues and can be can be better equipped to support, to support the community through policy. Thanks for listening to our family and experience today. We appreciate every opportunity to speak on behalf of our rare Pompeii disease community.
thanks again, everybody. We appreciate it. And can you guys say thanks? Say hi. Yes. <laughs> thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you to the whole club crew, Mike and Stephanie. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, we really appreciate it. There's nothing like um, hearing stories from patients and individuals and their families. We appreciate that. Um, and then we'd like to turn it over now, pass it along to Genevieve. Genevieve, I have to find you. you speak up when you're in the room. There you are, okay. <laughs> so many people here, which is just wonderful. Thank you for being here. I really, pre we really appreciate it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Love to hear your, your story um, with Pompeii disease and your connection to rare disease. Yeah, I think our, our story um, kind of stems al along with the, the club family. We got to meet them through the this newborn screening approval process. Um, our, our story with rare disease started um, four and a half years ago and was a, a little bit different from their experience. Um, my son Atlas was born um, six months before they had started the trial um, or the um, experiment on newborn screening with Pompeii disease. So he was not diagnosed um, at newborn screening. And on, until he was about three months old, we thought he was a, a perfectly healthy um, little boy, didn't love to eat and um, would slowly start missing his milestones. And so around three and a half to four months old, um, we found out his heart was enlarged and began our, our diagnostic journey um, he was in heart failure at that point. So it, it's an example of the difference that newborn screening can provide for a child. Um, it, Pompeii disease is, is one of many rare diseases that, that early diagnosis can make quite an impact. So for him, he was in heart failure in the cardiac ICU for several weeks um, while we figured out what was going on and, and began his treatment journey. So for us, that's where it really rang true in, in fighting for Pompeii disease to be on the newborn screening panel because for, for him, it was a little bit of a Hail Mary. We tried a lot of experimentation um, with FDA approved drugs just to have him here today um, through that, that scary initial experience. And I think along the way, there's a lot of opportunities that a council like this can help out, out families and, and struggles that, that we've hit because of um, being part of a, a disease that, that's not known, um, not known by the community, but even not known by the medical community either. For example, Atlas spends a lot of time um, in the ER and inpatient in the hospital with various colds. And we've gotten to the point where we have a little binder that we bring with him and trying to pass on literature because every nurse on the next shift has never heard of this disease before, what it means and what they can and can't do. Um, so making sure things like that are in place or even some of the things that we take for granted living um, day in and day out of this, of things that you should or shouldn't do for the disease. So educating the medical community about, about certain things like this, um, as, as well as hurdles that we've faced because of it being a rare disease. Um, a story I wanted to share was in, in um, his early years, Atlas continued in, in heart failure and respiratory failure. And one of the, the things that we sought was the Synergist shot or the RSV shot that many of you might be familiar with. And that was one of the things that we got continually denied um, and would fight for a couple of months for every season to get him that shot. And it would eventually get there. Um, but each and every year we'd hear that his disease was not on the qualifying list of diseases. It's not a genetic heart condition. It's not any disease that they had on their list of, of 200 diseases that qualified for this shot. Um, so it was a, a fun battle in, in trying to explain that they wouldn't, couldn't possibly have every disease <laughs> that would qualify for anything and, and just how many rare diseases are out there. So that was a, a big a fight and experience for us in um, that educational battle and on, on what's out there and, and what it means for each kiddo. Thank you for sharing that. That definitely, that definitely resonates um, with me and uh, with our, with our experiences with SMA also, the importance of that early um, diagnosis, 
early intervention there. And, and we're fortunate, those of us who um, are connected to disease spaces where there's newborn screening available, we're very fortunate because so many people, as you shared, kind of that diagnostic odyssey take years to find a diagnosis and all the damage that goes on physically and emotionally during that time. So newborn screening is so important. So thank you for your advocacy and for coming here today. We, we appreciate that. Dan, Danny, I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to remind people, if you are interested in turning on your video and joining on camera, um, feel free to do so. If you click the start video button um, in your little box, that should work just fine. But if you have any questions, feel free to always message us in the chat too. We can help navigate you through that. Thank you. Thanks, Elise. Okay, so before we hear from um, Sheldon Garrison, who is a research scientist at Aurora Research Institute, um, I am excited to introduce you to individuals who you may see in research or medicine in the future, and those are members of the newly formed Students for Rare chapter at UW-Madison. These are undergraduate and medical students of a variety of backgrounds who are passionate about learning about how they can support the rare disease community as students with personal ties to rare diseases, and also as some um, prepare for a future in the medical field. So I will start with you, Rachel, um, to introduce the chapter, and then I think some of the other students who are uh, here are going to just introduce themselves quickly. Yes, hello. So like Danny said, my name is Rachel Kirchner and I'm a current first year medical student at UW-Madison. And part of the reason we wanted to start a rare disease chapter is when I was in undergrad, I was a genetics major and we learned all about these different rare diseases that a lot of people have never heard of and typically don't have a lot of treatment options. And it was through this that really inspired me to become a physician and try to help treat those with rare genetic conditions that a lot of people haven't heard of. So as a student for Rare Chapter, we have three main goals. We wanna help educate both medical students and the Madison community to have a better understanding on rare diseases. We wanna be advocates and allies for those with rare diseases and we wanna help fundraise for NORD. So we're all really looking forward to getting to know the rare disease community a little better and are really excited that this chapter gotta get started. So there's a few of us here that are gonna also introduce ourselves and give a little background as to why they were interested in Students for Rare. Yeah, so I'm Lily Allison. Like Rachel, I'm a first year medical student as well. Um, and I actually have a rare disease um, that I was diagnosed with when I was like 13. Um, so I've been like the patient, I still am a patient, but I've been the patient. Now I'm kind of transitioning to like that other role. Um, so, you know, obviously the personal ties, but also just, you know, like I'm an expert in my rare disease, but I want to kind of be more involved in the community as a whole. Um, and then you know, take that into my role as a physician so that I can be, you know, like the best possible provider for my future patients. So, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Kat Pardo. I am also a first year medical student and I um, picked up an interest in kind of advocating for and becoming a, you know, advocate for the rare disease community when I worked at the Undiagnosed Diseases Program at the National Institutes of Health. Um, and there I was able to see how like the, the, you know, voices and, um, concerns of people with rare diseases were illuminated, um, by the community and, um, you know, through medical interventions and, um, kind of advocacy interventions were able to at least support or uplift these communities and it's their goals and aspirations that I hope to embody in my future medical career. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Thornton and I'm also a first year medical student at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I became interested in joining Students for Rare um, because growing up I had a friend with Charcot Marie too and just hearing their struggles and what they went through with medical providers and then also knowing that I myself would like to go into fields that do have higher proportions of patients with rare diseases. Um, I wanted to join so I could learn how to properly advocate for my future patients and help them out. Thank you. Hi, my name is Claudia. I'm also a first year medical student. Um, so um, I wanted to join Students for Rare um, because I wanted to learn more about folks with rare diseases, um, hear their stories and learn how to best support these individuals. Um, 
as both a clinician and as an advocate. Thank you for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Beckman. I am an undergrad studying math and I was interested in joining Students for Nord because I wanted to find a way to advocate and fundraise for those diseases which do not get as much attention as they deserve and help um, figure out how to advocate for those with rare diseases. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. So I just want to give a plug for Students for Rare because it's our first Students for Rare chapter in Wisconsin. Um, it's so great to see students and people going into the medical field or um, just interested in supporting our community get involved um, and be proactive in that. So NORD has Students for Rare chapters and also um, students for rare like high school clubs. So if you know a young adult or high school student who's interested in supporting um, and, and starting their own chapter or club, please reach out and we will, we will get that connected. So we look forward to hearing what you all work on and I'm sure we'll have you back for more um, RAN Action or Rare Action Network events in the future. So we will um, transition over to Sheldon Garrison who has a hand in helping to um, encourage students also to get into the rare disease field and be supportive of, of our community amongst some other fantastic research. Um, Sheldon has been involved with the Rare Disease Day event in Wisconsin for years now, even prior to when I was involved. Um, so just thankful for your uh, continued support and your expertise and please share with us um, what your perspectives have been. Yeah, and so I just want to say two things. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I was going to talk about one thing, and you all fired me up. It's probably that in a few cups of coffee, but you all fired me up to talk about something a little bit different, too. And, and before I get to that, I do want to put in a plug. I see a number of my METC students. I, I teach there part-time, love it, and I love the fact that they are here learning. They're going into a variety of different healthcare fields, um, ranging from nursing, ex, you know, red techs, um, medical coding, and they're here supporting. And, you know, they don't, they don't have to be. I mean, I'm bribing with a little extra credit, but they don't have to be. Uh, and I, I'm super proud uh, that they are here. Uh, so, yeah, you know, one of the things with rare disease from the research perspective is that I think we're at a really exciting and pivotal time. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a time when we can get so many different people, so many different stakeholders coming together for an event like this, contributing to these types of uh, conversations and really making changes both in their own personal and professional lives and uh, as a state. And so I'm pretty excited about that. And I've found, uh, I will speak from some personal experience, I've found finally, finally, that people in leadership positions are starting to really listen to some of the conversations we're trying to um, have about rare disease. They'll sit down with me personally and, and talk about what the impact is. And in fact, I do wanna bring up some interesting research because I think it plugs in to what the first couple conversations were. Um, but I love the fact that we're having these intentional, intentional conversations. And I can say from Advocate Aurora, health, one of the exciting things that we have from our research side is people are willing to contribute to our biorepository. For those affected by rare disease in the families, um, I can't tell you how important that is. You know, there are really critical decisions and investigations that are made just based on your generous don uh, donations to the biorepository. And I, it's, it's just so important. Um, but, you know, there's not without uh, challenges, you know, with this. Uh, from, a, again, the research perspective, we're still working on getting the right models. And so that means we need more and more engagement from advocacy groups and, most importantly, those affected by rare disease and their patients. We need to hear about not just the big stuff, uh, but the little things. Uh, for instance, Prader willi syndrome. This is a condition where people... Uh, have an insatiable appetite and they eat to morbid obesity and there's health, um, you know, health concerns related to that. But what we don't necessarily hear about broadly is the skin picking where people pick their skin to the point of paralysis or bite their nails to the bone. Um, we need to hear more about that too because there's other types of treatments and other types of approaches that can really engage other types of people. 
Uh, also having the right animal models in the funding to support that is key. And, and this is really the, the tie-in. Um, I don't know if uh, the Cushman family is on, but I, I hope they know I actually bring up their story every single time I talk about my work uh, within our healthcare system. And this is a family affected by Crab A disease. Their son, Colin, uh, passed away uh, not that long ago from Crab A. And Colin, it was, I think, a real inspiration uh, for myself and, and I would argue for many of us here uh, within the state. And um, Colin had a condition that had it been caught, there were certain treatment opportunities, uh, certain treatments that it could have, um, but it wasn't like many people with rare diseases it wasn't caught early. Uh, the average uh, time to diagnosis from the time symptoms begin is over five years uh, for rare diseases. And, and to me, this is completely and totally unacceptable. I think we're ethically and morally obligated to do more. Uh, and that's not just through newborn screening, but that's through some of these other types of screening tests like whole genome or whole exome as we further refine that, or even targeted gene sequencing where we're able to detect at least clinically actionable conditions. Because if you think about it, uh, about one in 10 people uh, have a rare disease, okay? And from a an financial impact, and this is part of the research we have currently in review, we have a publication we pulled together for this. We found that this less than 10% of the US population seems to account for nearly 70% of national healthcare costs. And there's a huge percentage of people on, you know, public, um, you know, that work with public payers like Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so this is, this is a monster issue that I think at this point is currently going unrecognized. I am willing to bet it's costing the state, uh, state a considerable amount of money that goes beyond uh, patient healthcare uh, considerations because of that. And so it includes, you know, just the, these conditions oftentimes are very complex and people stay in the hospital for two, three, even four times as long, especially in pediatrics, and something like nearly four times as long that people spend in the hospital uh, with rare conditions. And so uh, that's, that's a key thing. W one thing that I'm trying to do, and hopefully some of the conversations today will lead to even more of this, is trying to develop certain ways to screen for these rare conditions pre-symptomatically so we can start detecting these conditions much early on uh, before symptoms begin so we can have answers like we heard with uh, both Pompeii families uh, so we can give them the answers that need me, uh, they need. No family should have to be worried about their three-month-old child um, and we can do a lot more. So that's my, you fired me up with those conversations and then I also wanted to say we have a, we have a lot of great things coming but I, I really think we, all of us here and more need to work on this. Uh, and I'm not saying just that superficially, like legitimately, there's my email and phone number. We need to work on this. Do not hesitate to call or email so we can do that. And I'm spending a huge part of my life doing exactly that right now. So thank you uh, for having me here. Thank you, Sheldon, for sharing your perspective. And and um, you're so right. And I think that's one of the most um, encouraging things about moving forward in a uh, uh, Rare Disease Advisory Council here in Wisconsin, or RDAC as I'll shorten it so we don't keep saying that over and over again, but that is that um, it's a tangible thing that we can get behind and start to have real benchmarks and goals for, um, for our community and what we'd like to reach and or accomplish and pulling in um, legislators and other stakeholders to get involved and, and have some of those tangible steps. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, Elise, do you mind going to uh, Representative Vining's slide? We're going to have her speak first just for scheduling. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'm so excited that we have Representative um, Robin Vining and Representative Barbara Dietrich here today. Um, Representative Vining is the Wisconsin State Assembly Representative for the 14th District. Um, we are just thankful to have you here today and for your interest in um, the rare disease community and especially your prioritization of healthcare, which is a forefront issue um, with the rare disease space. So thank you for being here. 
Well, thank you for having me. It is an honor to be here, so thank you. Um, so good afternoon. I am State Representative Robin Vining. I represent the 14th Assembly District, as she mentioned. Um, that includes the people of Brookfield, Wauwatosa, and Milwaukee. This is my second term in office, and I serve on the committees on health, mental health, children and families, and small business development. I'm also a small business owner and I live with my family in Wauwatosa. So as mentioned, I'm a member of the Assembly Committee on Health for a second term, and I really appreciate the opportunity to consider legislation related to health and um, health care in Wisconsin uh, through working on this committee. One of my priorities is ensuring that all Wisconsinites have access to to affordable and high quality health care. I am currently working on legislation related to maternal and infant health, epinephrine access, and advocating for budget priorities related to mental health, violence interruption and prevention, and maternal and infant health. So Governor Evers introduced his 2021 to 23 biennial state budget last week. And this begins the budget process, which will last several months. Uh, many provisions of the budget are related to health. So badger care expansion, prescription drug affordability, mental health services, maternal and infant health programs, public health investments, among many others. So I encourage you to take a look at the proposals in the governor's budget and share your voice in the upcoming budget listening session or public hearings that will be scheduled in the coming months. Um, so something happening next Wednesday would be, um, you can follow Forward Wisconsin to Forward Wisconsin on Facebook um, and Twitter and, um, and find out about upcoming meetings. We have a meeting next Wednesday at 7 p.m. It is a listening session held by the Wisconsin State Assembly Democrats, and um, it's specifically on the topic of health. So you may want to come. Um, it's listening, which means as legislators, we do the listening. And so uh, you would be able to come and talk about the issues that are important to you in the state budget specific to rare diseases. So issues that impact the rare disease community and any legislative effort underway to address these issues. A few state policy issues that commonly impact the rare disease community um, are these three. So Medicaid eligibility. Badger care expansion is included in Governor's e Governor Evers' proposed budget again this session, which would expand Badger care availability to include over 90,000 more Wisconsinites. It would also save 634 million dollars in state money and it draws down an additional 1.3 billion in federal money to invest in other crucial health programs. Um, step therapy. So this passed the legislature and was signed into law last session. Actually, I think my colleague, Representative Dietrich, who's going to speak today, um, I think she's I think she testified for that bill. Um, so that passed the legislature, was signed into law last session. This is something that passed through our Assembly Health Committee and something that I voted for as a member on that committee. Um, third, out-of-pocket prescription drug costs. So Governor Evers' proposed budget has many provisions related to reducing prescription drug costs, including a prescription drug affordability review board and establishing an office of prescription drug affordability. All right, so best ways for advocates to engage with legislators about rare diseases, right? So from my perspective, there are a few ways to get in contact with and engage with legislators on important topics, such as the formation of a rare disease advisory council. The most common form of communication is through sending emails or making phone calls to a legislator's office. You can also set up a virtual meeting or a scheduled phone call with a legislator or staff. And pre-pandemic, there are also, and, and I would like to say, post-pandemic, there will, um, hope, I look forward to when we return to the opportunities to meet with legislators through in-district office hours. We've held them almost, almost monthly and, well, until the pandemic and look forward to resuming those. Um, along with town halls or listening sessions or, or advocacy days such as this one. And um, right now during the pandemic, most of these have moved to virtual formats or at least have virtual options. The listening session next Wednesday is virtual. 
and um, and I will say one of the reasons that we started in our district um, in district office hours before the pandemic was because sometimes you want to talk about things that are more personal than you want to talk about in a town hall, right? Um, and so I think it's nice to have that private or smaller space uh, to talk to your legislator. When we do them, we line them up rather than a small group, we line them up. So we give everybody a time slot. So you have private one-on-one -on -one time with your legislator and the staff. So what is important to keep in mind when connecting with a legislator? So how to share your story. If you feel comfortable sharing your own story related to an issue, please do that. Stories matter to legislators. It can be related to your professional or your personal experience, or if a family member or a loved one is comfortable with you sharing their story, then you should share that. Don't share a story without permission if it's not your story, but if you have a story you're able to share, storytelling is very powerful and helpful when working with legislators. When a legislator thinks of a bill or of an issue, then they have a story in their mind and who this might impact. And I can tell you from working with other legislators, um, it can be one story that can really shift the thinking of a legislator. So, um, so think about how you can story tell. And then how to stay connected in, in how to stay connected with your legislator or work together in the future. Um, it is helpful to send follow-up emails, phone calls, um, cards. I think I just got a card, just opened it right before we got on here. We got to keep them all on my desk. Um, so um, say, thank you for meeting today. Here is my contact information. I look forward to working with you on an issue. Thank you for co-sponsoring or co-authoring a bill. Um, layer, layer that contact so you have layers of contact with your legislator. Um, and sign up for e-newsletters or follow your legislators on social media. Many legislators send a regular e update. Um, we send one every Friday. We have forward Fridays. Um, and many are active on social media such as Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And this is a good way to engage with your legislators. But if you want to contact them on a specific, specific issue, it's still best to email or call the office directly. I'll tell you the way my office works is when you email in, we save your email in our system and we tag it with your topic so that anytime that say a bill may come up on that topic, I can actually ask my staff, can you please pull all of the emails and phone, phone logs that we've received on this topic? And she can put them right there for me. So I know everybody who's written in on, say, rare diseases or on a specific bill related to rare diseases. And um, sometimes I, um, if a bill passes through committee and I know it matters to that group of people, I will did it last week, sit down and call through that list of people who had written in about that bill. And I'll say, we've just passed this unanimously through committee. And I just wanted to let you know that it's moving on. So um, sometimes you may get a little update. So um, I hope that's helpful. I hope that you feel better equipped uh, to advocate and engage with your legislators. If you have any questions, follow up. We'd be happy to answer them. The first step is really just showing up and being willing to learn. And um, here you are. So step one complete. Um, but thank you for thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's an honor to be here. We welcome follow up and um, and really just this is the beginning, right? So building on the relationship that we have just started here today. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. That was, those were um, great points, really helpful. Um, so we just really appreciate it. And we will definitely be um, seeing more of you in the future as we move along. So um, now we will pass it over to Representative Barbara Dietrich. So Barbara has been um, a longtime supporter and champion for rare disease, the rare disease community. Um, we're thrilled to have her here with us today. I got to meet her for the first time last year at our um, Rare Disease Day event that we eked in just before the pandemic shut everything down. So that was one of my last social events and it was a, um, a real pleasure to get to meet you. So thank you for being here today. Um, and please share with us uh, your perspective. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to say, this is rather serendipitous because um, as I said at the beginning of this whole meeting, um, I was a rare disease partner and ambassador almost since the beginning of 
foundation of Rare Disease Day back in 2008. Um, to give people a little background on who I am, um, I'm the face of Rare. Um, my family is affected by two rare disorders. We, we became a rare disease family uh, first in 2000 with the birth of my son. And um, then uh, one of our daughters was diagnosed with another rare disorder, um, completely unrelated, about four years later. And um, so I, I guess what I want to offer as a legislator is not just my personal story, but a word of encouragement, because I don't think I would be serving in our state legislature if I had not just been a passionate mom fighting for my family. So kudos to all you advocates, all you parents fighting for your kids. Don't stop um, because you make a difference. I mean, um, my family got to um, not only work on the state level for um, legislative advocacy, but we also went to Washington DC and um, got to advocate for and then watch the passage of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that is now part of federal law um, so that your employers and insurance companies um, cannot discriminate against you based on known genetic information. That's a very big deal. Um, I will tell you being part of this community, you know, so, so often when we do these advocacy events, we're looking towards, you know, what, what can we get at and what can, can um, what are we lacking? Um, but I want to encourage you to also spend some time reflecting on what we've accomplished because it, it's amazing how far we've come uh, just in the past couple decades with, with rare diseases. What we know about human genetics now is profound. Um, and that really gives us um, a lot more um, focus. And um, Sheldon, uh, kudos to you and, and your support. You'll be hearing from me um, because I have some thoughts. I, you know, obviously um, in these genetic advances, we can do some really targeted things to help people, okay? Um, I want to uh, also encourage families, if you have the opportunity, you know, we've engaged in, and of course, this depends on where you're at on the timeline and the, the health scale, we've engaged in research studies, whether that's um, allowing um, for genetic information to be um, collected and studied um, for the benefit of your wider community, or even um, drug testing. You know, we, we had a really promising um, therapy that we tried and my son was so disappointed because there were some adverse effects and the research study was halted, but now he's gonna get involved in another one. Um, and he's old enough now, there's a specific reason why I'm not telling you what my kids' diagnoses are because they're young adults now and I don't have their permission to share that information. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, our son, we jokingly call the million dollar man because um, his, just his medication alone uh, costs over $300,000 a year. So that being said, obviously I have a clear vision of um, what we need to do as far as um, both legislation and um, just public and interaction with this because we want we want incentive to find cures and that sort of thing as well. Um, that being said, I want to springboard a little bit off of what Representative Vining said and encourage you do get a hold of your legislators. There's just, you know, it, there are people just like you. We're approachable and um, keep knocking at the door because some of them aren't very good at necessarily answering your emails or phone calls, but, but you keep at it because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And um, I always made sure my lawmakers knew who I was. Um, so I think that's helpful. Also, um, you know, I want to tell you that we are working on things that might not be on your radar screen. For example, the step therapy, yes, but now um, uh, the Crab A testing bill was reintroduced by Senator Teston and Representative Novak. Again, I hopped on board that right away um, because we know that genetic screening makes all the difference. And it's such a simple thing. Um, 
to to combat that rare disorder. So um, all of you get a hold of your legislator and encourage them to sign on because it's um, not until they they hear from you that that advances. So do some of those things. Um, build a relationship. There's no shortcut to those relationships, and they are extremely important. And your voice your voice matters. Um, and it helps to bring that understanding. Because I used to say when I was doing legislative advocacy, those, anybody in your world is one emergency room visit away from being you. You know, um, whether it's a debilitating car accident or whatever, they could be in your shoes. So um, finding ways to, to bridge those gaps is an important thing. I also say appeal to both sides of the aisle. Republican or Democrat, don't don't become bar, uh, partisan in, in your advocacy, um, because uh, I always found, you know, if you can show lawmakers how this saves the taxpayer money to deal with stuff on the front side versus the back side of care and treatment, that really can advance your cause. Um, so that's one thing I have always been mindful of over the years. So keep at it, and a and a good dose of humor will will go a long way too. Per, you know, it helps you persevere through all this, and um, I just I'm so excited to be with you all and see how far um, this rare disease day has come. Um, the students, I wanted to say, I saw some of the undergraduates are are involved in non medical fields. That's important too because we know, like our financial counselors and whatnot. Uh, can really show families how to cope um, with the disproportionate um, strain. Even, you know, we found that that um, it, it went beyond the medical costs, just some of the, the um, how much we were on the road or out-of-pocket costs of having rare disease family members can really add up. So having having those people in math and accounting and everything are, are really, really helpful to have. So thanks for having me. And I hope to hear from all of you. Get a hold of my office because uh, whether you're in my district or not, I'm Western Waukesha County, the middle of Jefferson County, Eastern Dane County, that's my district. And, um, but I'm happy to help hear from all of you. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here um, and continuing your support. You highlighted so many important things and um, I absolutely agree with you that a lot of people become advocates after they experience directly a rare disease because it's just a way to take something that is hard um, and tough and and turn it into something different, right? Channel all that energy. So. Um, so thank you for pointing that out and we just hope more people will get involved. And I love that there are students for rare that are not in the medical field uh, because we need that diverse perspective of, of uh, people to, to move forward. We need everybody in it together. So thank you so much. And also I wanna give you a shout out for the forthcoming um, house resolution to recognize rare disease day. Thank you very much for that. We really appreciate that. Um, I had in my notes here that I wanted to give a shout out also to Senator Teston, even though he can't be here today due to a scheduling conflict. He, um, this week, there was a Senate resolution for, I believe it was, maybe it was last week, to recognize Rare Disease Day um, on the 28th. And there is our Rare Disease Day proclamation from Governor Evers too. So, so much excitement and um, spotlight on rare diseases it just benefits us all in so many ways to be able to uh, shed light on this and how many people it impacts, which we've we've heard here today. So, so thank you very much for being for being a, of support and also um, Representative Vining for being here. So um, I want to make sure I didn't forget anything. I'm so glad that people highlighted the um, Colin Cushman's law for Crab Bay. I had. Wanted to bring that up also too, because that's happening right now. Um, I don't think that Kevin and his family are here today, but um, we appreciate all the support that we have um, read about. And I know that they have just worked tirelessly to advocate um, and, and honor Colin. So it's exciting to see that moving forward again, and hopefully it will be successful this time. So 
that was a lot of information here today. Lots of great information. It's so great to see so many people here. Um, I hope everyone feels like they have a little bit of a better understanding of what Rare Action Network is about and who makes up our community. And also a little better understanding of how an RDAC could benefit us here in Wisconsin. We will be moving forward with, um, moving forward with formulating what that bill may look like and who may involve, be involved in supporting it. So um, we invite everyone to support that. And we will, before we end today, we'll talk about ways to make sure that you're on our email list so that you get updates on upcoming meetings. We'll have another meeting on our deck in March. So we'll make sure everyone gets that. But before we um, have a couple things just to wrap up here, I wanted to do a little activity. Um, Someone had said that, uh, one of my colleagues had said that they at an event asked everyone to share one word that they thought um, described the rare disease community um, from patients and advocates and caregivers to researchers and industry and legislators, um, everyone all together. So I thought that would be fun. Excuse me, I thought that would be a fun thing to do. Um, so I'm just going to ask everyone to put in what your one word would be into the chat. And we will keep those and um, put together a word cloud, kind of like you see here, and um, use it at future events. We'll include it um, at future virtual events. And then, fingers crossed, one day when we get to actual, actually see each other, um, we'll get it printed out and framed so that we can have it. It's just a a great reminder and a time for us to pause and focus on some strengths, which we all need to do. Um, so I'll give everybody a little bit, a minute just to do that. And, and then we will move on to our, our next um, portion. So while people are tossing their um, word in the chat box, we'll move on. Um, there will be two uh, lucky winners of a rare disease swag bag with all of the wonderful things you see here. That zebra is a, that's a hot commodity in my house. My kids love that thing. So you want to get your hands on those. And I've heard that the socks are super comfortable too. So after the event, we will um, randomly draw two names for individuals who attended today, and you'll be notified by email, and then um, that will be sent out to you in mid-March, by mid-March. So just be aware that um, that will be forthcoming. And then, so in closing, I just want to thank everyone um, for taking time out of your day to join us um, in support of Rare Disease Day in Wisconsin. Um, we definitely invite everyone to be a partner with us if you haven't already um, signed up to be a member of the Rare Action Network. You can find that link right here at rarewisconsin.org. And then there's a link to join the Rare Action Network. And that is how you get on our um, email list so that you can make sure you get all of the emails on upcoming events like this um, or any other event that we have. Also the state report card for Wisconsin this is, this is the link here for it. Um, so if you want to look at that in closer or look more closely at that, you can. And um, the bottom link is the Join Rare Action Network. So that's the direct link. But if you go to the rarewisconsin.org, you'll see a link to, to join the Rare Action Network. Um, I think that that covers everything. I just am so grateful to see everyone here today. Thank you for taking the time. It really is an example of how you know, alone we really are rare, but together we are strong. When you put so many people together, there's just no telling what we can uh, what we can accomplish together. So thank you all for being here. And yeah. yes, we just, a, we just have a quick closing video. We're going to close out the yeah. day. So just I was just going to say, I think we have one more video. So if everyone wants to um, turn their uh, webcams off again, so we can actually see, before you'll be okay. I just wanted to um, see if you guys can all give um, Danny, I would just like to personally thank you for coordinating this great event. 
Um, and also, you know, Wisconsin, I want to give a shout out because Danny is actually going to be our honoree at this year's Rare Impact Awards that Nord puts on. Um, it'll be taking place in June and uh, she will be being honored. So let's just give her a quick, like, silent round of applause. Uh, I figured I'd share that since we're with all your Wisconsin peeps here. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I did. <laughs> So I will put the link to the um, announcement in the chat right there, and uh, feel free to take a look, and hopefully you guys can tune in June 28th to the Impact Awards and see Danny get our award, um, and I will now uh, thank you all for coming, and I'll post this video, and we're good. Thank you, Kristen. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At NORD, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others, and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the Volunteer State Ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our state. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told, when you hear hoofbeats, they think horses, not zebras. What about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At NORD, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. NORD support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, NORD, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at NORD, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community. On Rare Disease Day, and every day. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.